It's usually a good thing to start the story at the beginning. Well, actually, we probably don't need to go quite that far back. What I'm really interested in is the floating continents theory, the theory that gained traction around 1950, 1960 or so, where the continents of the Earth kind of floated together and apart. Each of the continents is on one or more big plates, and these plates shift around over a course of time, very long periods of time. In the beginning, there seems to have been a great deal more water uh, than there is today. We're going to be focusing on East Africa because that's where we're going. Notice that the big change is that East Africa has split away from Africa about a hundred million years from now. Now why do we think that that's going to happen? And what effect does it have on where we are? Well, there's a rift valley uh, that's already forming. Uh, and uh, that rift valley begins way up north uh, near where the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden are, not too far uh, from where Saudi Arabia is now. And that rift proceeds through Ethiopia and Somalia down into uh, Kenya and Kenya it splits into two, two branches, one to the east and one to the west of Lake Victoria, and then it extends down into Mozambique, where it breaks out at about the point where the Zambezi River enters the Indian Ocean. We're going to East Africa, uh, more specifically Kenya, the national park called Tsavo. And the period of time that we're interested in the most is the British period. Originally, uh, this area of Africa was occupied by the Sultan of Oman, who had a massive slave trade going on through here. 
the Portuguese came in and pushed the Sultan out and there was a fight between the two of them but eventually the British take over in the 19th century and by late 19th century the British are starting to develop this area. Back as far as the 1500s Mombasa had been the major trading port for the Omanis and the Portuguese recognized what a great port that was. It is in fact probably the best seaport along the eastern African coast. In those days uh, the Germans had German East Africa and they were threatening uh, to absorb Uganda to the north on this map. The Belgians uh, were in the Congo and they were also moving towards Uganda and the British decided that they would like to have it as well. So they proposed to build a railway, a railway from Mombasa up to what is now Nairobi. Nairobi incidentally just means cold water. Until the railway came through, it was simply a swamp. Now it's the capital of Kenya. And that railroad goes from Mombasa and then crosses the Savo River, which is near the center of this map, and heads on up to Nairobi and then on to Uganda. The critics of this railway, and there were many, uh, because in today's dollars that would cost almost a billion dollars, uh, they called this the lunatic line. Sort of like the bridge to nowhere. The line ran 600 miles from the coast through Nairobi all the way to Lake Victoria. It was built to bring British goods to the interior and raw materials out to ports on the coast. It would encourage British farmers to come out here and settle. There was plenty to merit the title Lunatic Line. There was the cost, 534 million pounds in today's money. There was the engineering required to allow a train to climb from sea level into the mountains and then to plunge down into the Great Rift Valley. And to construct 1,200 bridges on the way. But it wasn't the British who built the railway, it wasn't even the Africans. This remarkable feat was the work of 32,000 labourers, craftsmen and engineers brought in by the British from India. They knew how to build railways there. Not only did Indian workers have the skills to build the railway and the experience, they also were familiar with the wage system. The local Africans uh, were not familiar with uh, labor. Uh, it had never occurred to them to work for money. Uh, it simply wasn't part of their culture and they didn't do it. So virtually all the workers on the railway line are not Africans. They are in fact Indian. On average, the Lunatic Express cost the lives of four workers for every mile of track. Excursions into the interior almost invariably started in Mombasa. And before the time of the railway, those excursions almost always involved hiring a small army of porters. The railway changed all that. It started uh, in Mombasa on the coast and therefore at sea level and from there it rose steadily into the highlands. The first barrier that it crossed of any significance was the desert. Since speed was essential uh, the British Empire laid down a temporary track followed by a permanent track. In the Taru uh, Desert this became a problem uh, because 
the temporary track uh, could be undermined. Uh, once upon a time, uh, a rhinoceros stepped near the uh, temporary track bed and a rain came up and a puddle formed in the footprints of the rhinoceros and it undermined the, uh, the train. The train overturned. Now the interesting thing about this particular train was it was a troop train. One of the reasons why speed was so important was because troops were needed in Uganda where there was a small war going on. As the progress of the railroad continued, it rose up from sea level, past the desert, and into Tsetsefly territory. Now, the rail construction depended a great deal on thousands of animals, and the Tsetse flies killed off almost all of them. And that basically brought work to a halt. So, in the Tsetse fly area, we find 1,500 out of the 1,800 transport animals all killed. And to some extent, those animals were replaced with machinery, steam tractors in particular. After going through the Tetsi Fly Belt, uh, the next major obstacle as uh, the expedition climbed uh, into the mountains was they were hit by a drought. They surmounted the uh, drought and made it to the eastern escarpment and then they came down over the escarpment and found easy track laying in the Rift Valley and then they went up over the western escarpment and after it crossed that peak it was easy going down to Lake Victoria. During the track laying of course there were numerous bridges that were thrown up and a fair number of labor disputes that had to be settled. Now the year is 1900 and there's a problem. Up in Nairobi there's a labor dispute and so the railway sends a negotiator up and his name is Charles Ryan and Charles is a superintendent of police and he takes the railway from Mombasa up towards Nairobi and on the way up, he and his friends heard about a man-eating lion. And so they decided that they would move their car off onto a siding that was near where the lion had last been seen. And that they would wait all night if necessary to be able to shoot the man-eater. Well, they were going to take turns as to who was staying up and who was sleeping. And Charles Tarn uh, comes up. And uh, Charles is guarding the door. One of the men is sleeping on the floor. And one of them is on the top bunk. Now, Charles gets very, very sleepy. And he decides he's going to go to sleep as well. So he does go to sleep. He goes on to the uh, main bunk, the lower bunk. And the lion comes at this time and he starts nosing around the car and Charles has forgotten to latch the door and so the lion is able to use his nose to push the door open. The lion gets in and he is stepping on the man on the floor and he grabs Charles. The noise awakens the person on the top bunk. He jumps on top of the lion and uses the lion to get to the toilet where he locks himself into the toilet. Charles, unfortunately, is in the mouth of the lion. The lion's tail hits the door and the door slams shut and it frightens the lion. The lion thinks he's trapped. And so the lion smashes through the window, taking Charles with him. This is the only time that I know of where labor negotiations have ended with one of the negotiators being eaten by a lion. Oh, and uh, do keep a lookout for this train seat. You will see it again. We're going to be focusing now on the railway bridge crossing over the Tsavo River. 
The first British engineer that was there, who built a bridge, a temporary bridge, was Ronald Preston. Now Savo had its name a long time before the British were in this area. Savo means the place of the slaughter and it probably refers to some wars uh, between the Maasai and the local indigenous population. Uh, when the Maasai uh, declared war and moved through an area, they left no one alive, neither women nor children. Tsavo had a reputation. It was the main transit route for the slave and ivory traffic down to Mombasa. And uh, there was a, a, a legend uh, that uh, people would disappear uh, from the uh, caravan, from the convoy. Uh, people that lived in Mombasa might disappear in the Savo area even when they were headed back to Mombasa where they would be paid and it seems unlikely that people would simply desert at that stage. When Preston got into the area he too started losing people. At first he thought that the individual's co-workers had done them in because they had been unusually frugal and that they had killed them for their money. But then he started discovering bodies and he discovered that these were lions that were doing the killing. And the railway workers discovered the same thing and they threatened to revolt and uh, go home. Well, uh, Preston told them that the problem was only here at Savo and that they only had to lay track out of Savo to get out of danger. And so the Indian workers worked like Trojans to get out and they laid track in record time. Even so, Preston lost 17 people. Next, Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson arrives He's a railroad engineer that's been charged with putting in the permanent buildings and permanent bridge over the Savo River. But he starts having the same problem uh, that Preston had. The lions start carrying off his people and that's the story that we're going to be telling. I've been reading John Patterson's book the uh, Man-Eaters of Tsavo. It's one of the best hunting books around, and I know that because Teddy Roosevelt said so. Uh, what Teddy Roosevelt said was, the most thrilling book of true stories ever written is Colonel Patterson's The Man-Eaters of Tsavo. That must make it one of the best. Now there have been three uh, movies uh, made out of uh, the Preston uh, Lions of Savo uh, experience, uh, two of them in the 1950s, but the best one is The Ghost in the Darkness in the 1990s. Now best doesn't mean that it is uh, historically accurate in every detail, but compared to the other two movies, uh, it's fairly uh, close to the 1907 book that Patterson wrote. This is the most famous true African adventure. Famous because what took place at Tsavo never happened before. Colonel John Patterson was there when it began. A fine Irish gentleman, a brilliant engineer. Remember this. Even the most impossible parts of this story really happened. We're in a race, Colonel, and the prize is nothing less than the continent of Africa. We are building the most expensive and daring railroad in history for the glorious purpose of saving Africa from the Africans and, of course, to end slavery. Our competitors are the Germans and the French. We are ahead and we will stay ahead provided you do what I've hired you to do. Build a bridge across the River Savo and be finished in five months. The railway neatly divides Savo National Park into two halves, east 
and west. Together, both east and west are larger than the U.S. state of New Jersey. And so that's our next objective. We're headed for Tsavo National Park, where Patterson put his bridge. This is the old Savo station. Uh, there is a new Savo station, and uh, this Savo station is no longer in prime condition. Now this is the actual Savo River, uh, the way that it was the day that I saw it. You can see it's not really much of a river, but it is the biggest one in this particular neighborhood. Now, there is something going on uh, today that's gonna cause me a lot of trouble security here is very very high and uh, in fact some of the filming uh, that I wanted to do I couldn't do and the reason is because that second bridge in the background is the new bridge uh, the old bridge is the one in the foreground and the president uh, is going to be here to inaugurate the new rail service and that's caused a security problem there's a ranger with me um, this is Patterson's Bridge behind me. It's not exactly the way that Patterson uh, uh, built the bridge. In World War I, the Germans came over and uh, blew up uh, the, the bridge, but uh, it's substantially the same, and I think maybe a lot of the stonework is the same uh, that Patterson put up. Uh, behind me, there's a, a large uh, a highway and so you can probably hear some highway noise. And further on down, uh, there's another railway bridge, and that's the new bridge, and it's going to be inaugurated tomorrow. This is the new locomotive making the test run. The movie bridge is now in the lower right, and the actual Patterson Bridge is in the upper left and notice that the road bed on that one is black. If you take a look at the post World War I bridge you'll see that the sides are silver indicating that they've replaced the steel with aluminum. And when the Germans blew up the bridge, well that's the picture that you see in the lower right now. Uh, you can see that there's a certain amount of uh, carriage material and so forth that was uh, uh, damaged in the explosion, or destroyed really in the explosion. Because the Patterson Bridge was an important link between Nairobi and uh, Mombasa, in fact a vital link, it had to be replaced very quickly after it was destroyed and there was a wooden bridge that was thrown up as a temporary bridge and it probably looked a great deal like the bridge that Preston threw up uh, before uh, Patterson put in his permanent bridge. The new rail is uh, built by the Chinese and it's a high-speed rail. The river itself, the Savo River, uh, originates uh, on Mount Kilimanjaro, which is itself a volcano. In fact, it is three volcanoes. As a result of all the volcanic activity in the Rift Valley and Mount Kilimanjaro, it should come as no surprise then that there are lava flows here. Uh, this happens to be the Yatta lava flow, 13 and a half million years old and 200 miles long, making it the longest lava flow on the planet. There's another smaller lava flow, but one that's much more recent, called the Shatani lava flow. The Chitani lava flow is only about 200 years old. We're at the Chitani cave. Actually, it's more of a, a lava tube than it is a cave. But it's Chitani that I wanted to talk with you about. Chitani is a Swahili word. Well, actually, the Swahilis borrowed it. They borrowed it from the uh, Semites. It's a Semitic word originally. Uh, actually, uh, it, in English, uh, we have also borrowed this same word. Shatani in English is Satan. I was asking, uh, tell me about the uh, tell me about the rifle. What what do you have? 
I have a, a, the rifle is a Fabric National. Fabric National. Uh, and I have the live rounds. Yeah, uh -huh. hard one. Uh -huh. Yeah. What caliber? Caliber, as I told you, is seven point, uh, seven point two one. Seven point two one. And the rounds are hard rounds. Yeah, they are hard ones. Not soft rounds. Not soft. Mm. Yeah. And why are we taking this rifle with us? It's because we of our safety. We have to go with the rifle. Uh huh. Yeah. We never know what is inside. Yeah. So we have to go with the gun. So what might be down in the cave? Uh, uh, the cave we may come across uh, snakes and leopards and other dangerous animals. Leopards. But, uh, uh, but uh, we are not sure what is inside. We have to go inside and uh, we see. But if we come across those animals, uh, we ha I, I, we, we, I won't shoot because uh, it's risking inside. We have to withdraw yeah. and uh, leave yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah, we can't shoot inside. You can't shoot inside. But there might be a leopard in there. I hope so, but uh, we haven't seen it. Yeah. We have to go inside and see. And and there might be a snake in there. It might be there. A big snake? Um, uh, probably we can get, come across a big snake. Uh, like a rock python. Like a python, yeah. Yeah, 20 feet long? Uh, uh, maybe not that big. Maybe not, maybe <laughs> not that big. <laughs> Yeah. I have heard that down in this cave sometimes there are hyena. Is that true? Yeah, they uh, they go inside for hiding, and sometimes it's their territory. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it's cooler down there. Yeah, it could be there, but uh, we haven't got inside, so we have to get inside and confirm. Well, okay. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> well, then, then we'll do that. We'll do that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So. Let me go and confirm. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Pigam salaba to Kwanza la blood in here. Once the ranger cleared the uh, lava tube and uh, didn't find anything interesting, uh, the rest of us went down to see what uh, was down in the, uh, in the cave. Now, for reasons I don't entirely understand, uh, it strikes me that the, the ranger, the Maasai warrior, and the guide that were accompanying me were not exactly enthusiastic about going down into a lava tube uh, called the Devil's Cave, and uh, uh, where they might meet uh, hyenas, uh, leopards, and uh, large snakes. I think that they would have been rather uh, more happy 
if they had been with uh, Patterson fighting the lions on the surface. I was staying at a uh, lodge in the Nairobi National Park, uh, just at the edge of the city, uh, when on my back porch I saw a flash of brown and gray. The flash was headed around uh, my lodge towards the front door, so I opened the front door to see what it was. When I opened the front door, there was somebody standing in the uh, uh, doorway uh, wanting to get in. Obviously wanting to get in, but he didn't know how because there was this big ape in his way, and he was somewhat intimidated by that. It's a hyrax. Uh, a hyrax, curiously enough, is uh, closely related to the elephant and the manatee. Now, you wouldn't put those three together in a thousand years, I shouldn't think, but that's what they tell me. Hyrax are herbivores, uh, and uh, uh, they like to eat roses, I'm told, by the manager. Uh, he had put some roses in my room, and apparently the Hyrax were after them, because when I got back into my room, the Hyrax had beat me there, and uh, had uh, eaten the roses, and there were uh, rose petals all over. It turns out that, in fact, there was a whole herd of these little elephants staying at my uh, lodge, at my room, actually. And uh, they were just all over the place uh, doing everything. I was only there one night, and the next morning, uh, very early, we had to pull out in order to make the trip down to Savo. By road, uh, it's an all-day trip to go down uh, from Nairobi to Mombasa. Uh, 
there's only a two-lane highway that runs that way, and it is crowded with uh, truck traffic. It goes very, very slowly. Oh, there he is. We found bush babies at uh, Savo, and this is the way you usually see them. I think he's looking at us. Could be. He's got a big bushy tail. Usually about the only thing that you see is eye shine uh, jumping from tree to tree. Okay, you can leave your light off now, I see them. The filming done here uh, is being done with my infrared uh, vision camera. Uh, and I've got an infrared lamp uh, spotlight that I'm using uh, to highlight them. Later that night in my room, uh, something knocked over the uh, insect spray can and so I quickly turned on the light and there was a, a flash of gray there. And sure enough, there was a bush baby inside uh, my tent. The bush babies at Lion's Bluff Lodge uh, near Savo are quite tame. They're very habituated to people and they're everywhere. Bush babies are primates, uh, not squirrels, the way they appear. If you take a close look at their hands, uh, you'll see that their hands are very much like ours, with fingernails, not claws. Uh, this one is just now leaving the lodge's bar. Uh, it's at the bar uh, where these uh, bush babies sometimes get fed uh, fruit and the result is uh, they're quite used to people and quite willing to come in close. Now feeding the bush babies is a great deal of fun. It's a good way to be able to see them up close uh, to get uh, relatively good pictures of them. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that when they start coming into my room at night while I'm asleep and roaming around well, that kind of puts the end to it for as far as I'm concerned. Now here's something you'll recognize. It's a, a dung beetle uh, pushing along his uh, ball of dung. Um, it is interesting that they can't see where they're going because they're pushing the thing with their hind legs. So every once in a while they have to get up and take a look around to make sure that they're going in the right direction. Now that dung ball may very well have come from this animal. Uh, you recognize it, of course, it's a zebra. A type of uh, horse or donkey or ass, if you will. And the odd thing about it is that it has those stripes. And people have been trying to figure out why zebras have stripes for a very long time. And I think the consensus right now is the reason that they have those stripes is in order to uh, keep predators confused uh, when the her herd moves off uh, uh, rapidly in many different directions, maybe the stripes tend to dazzle them. Well, 
uh, there is that possibility, but there are other theories as well. As this chart shows, there are several different uh, striping patterns and to a certain extent the distinctiveness and the intensity of the striping pattern seems to change according to geography. The more intense striping patterns being closer to the equator and uh, the less intense ones uh, down uh, further uh, in Africa in colder areas. That suggests that uh, the stripes have something to do with temperature control. Temperature control is clearly why this uh, crocodile is gaping. Uh, he's trying to cool off uh, and uh, when he's uh, overheating or when he's uh, too cold he has to take various actions like that in order to control his temperature. Did you notice uh, that when you were looking at the snout that there were those little dots there? Well the interesting thing about those is he's very very sensitive at those locations to any vibrations that he might receive and this allows him to be able to get his food without seeing or hearing it he can catch it by touch here he's just waiting for some something to eat that might touch his uh, his mouth Savo is known for its elephants, especially elephants with large tusks. These tuskers can have super-sized tusks, up to around 100 pounds or a little bit more. Incidentally, that bluff in the background is where my lodge is. That's where Lion's Bluff Lodge is located. Notice the grass in the foreground. It's nice and thick. We're just getting done with the uh, rainy period. And the elephants haven't entirely moved back in. Right now, the only elephants that are moving in are the bull, bulls. Uh, the matriarchal herds will come in later. And you can see that on the leg of this uh, elephant, there's some urine trickling down. That indicates that the elephant is in must. Uh, must is a Hindu word, I've been told, and it means uh, that he's drunk. Uh, but as a practical matter, what it really means is he's going to be looking for a girlfriend and he's going to be supercharged. Now when the ears are out it is a warning that he's uh, you're close enough and he's telling you to back off but unless the trunk gets rolled up underneath the chin you don't have to worry too much about a serious charge although a mock charge is always a possibility. Attacking small trees uh, is also common when the bull is in lust. And of course there's nothing like an exuberant dust bath while you're waiting for the girls to come. Now this is a photograph of a super tusker, uh, and Savo has about uh, 10 of them probably, but there are only 25 in all of Africa, so Savo has an unusually high density of super tuskers. This particular one was named Satao II, and I mention that it was named Satao II because last New Year's it was poached. 
So Tao's two tusks each weighed over 110 pounds and uh, you need to have a 100 pound tusk to be a super tusker like Satao. But Satao was also known as being particularly easily photographed and easy to get along with for as far as people were concerned and that's not common with tuskers. He had been shot with a poison arrow but the poachers were caught and the body discovered before the ivory could be removed. Satao too was named after Satao, which was also a, a massive tusker, but it was poached in 2014. A primary difference was, the, however, that Satao was horribly mangled as a result of the poaching. The uh, thieves did get away with the ivory. As bad as the poaching of elephants is, it's nothing compared to the poaching of uh, rhinos. It may very well be true that in the very near future, there will be no rhinoceros left in the wild. Uh, the uh, matriarchal herds are beginning to come into Savo, and uh, elephants like nothing uh, better than a, a drink of water, even if it's muddy water, and a splash of mud on the body. It's uh, basically their spa treatments. They just love it. Incidentally, these elephants are frequently referred to as red elephants. Now, what makes them red, of course, is not the natural pigmentation of the skin, but rather the mud, uh, the red mud that gets caked on their, uh, on their bodies. Look at the uh, young males in the background. They're testing things out. We're going to be watching them for a few seconds. I think it's about time that I introduce you to my guide in Savo. I, uh, I want to introduce my guide to you. This is uh, Royan uh, Taylor, and uh, he's the world's greatest uh, cobra expert. Mm, I, 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 I thank you for the compliment, uh, Craig, but 
I think there are a few professors slightly more qualified than, than I am to, to receive that. But from You a, mean I'm paying you all this money yeah. and you are not the world's greatest expert on cobras? Well, when it comes to finding them in the field, I, pro I doubt you'll find anybody who knows it better than I do. Uh, okay. But from an expertise perspective, you, 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 you probably find a couple of professors who'd like to take me on 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 that, but we'll, we'll have a go. Okay, and uh, I understand that you're new to Kenya, is that right? No, I'm not new to Kenya. Mm -hmm. I am, I'm, I'm born and bred here. I'm, I'm third generation born in this country on both sides of my parents, so we have been here for a, for a very long time. So what do you do for a living here? You just do guiding? No, I, I, I run a snake farm. It's my, my primary job. Um, I'm director of an organization called Bioken Snake Farm. Uh, based in Watamu. We work with reptiles, but what we're really famous for is the work that we do with snakes. Um, I'm also involved with snake bite treatment. Um, I'm a founding trustee of the James Ash Anti-Venom Trust, which is named after my teacher and mentor who, who taught me what I know about snakes. And um, when, when, like in, during, during different times of year and season, I, 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 do, I do take guiding trips because I enjoy spending time in the bush. And Seeing as where part of your trip is to try and find some snakes, we'll, we'll see how we go. Okay, very good. Let's see how we go. Yeah, yeah, let's see how we go. Now, before we go out uh, snake hunting, uh, I want to point out that uh, Royan also has other interests as well, and one of them happens to be uh, scorpions. And you all know how I feel about scorpions. I just love hunting scorpions. And it happens that both of us have ultraviolet lights. And uh, so we go out looking for the local scorpions and collecting up a few of them. Um, this particular scorpion, as you can see, has a relatively fat tail and small pincers. And if you've seen any of my uh, movies before, you know that this one is somewhat dangerous. A uh, different kind of scorpion, one that has uh, large pincers and a relatively small tail, is relatively safe. This one is relatively safe. And he's going to change color right before your eyes because we've turned off the natural light and we've lay it, let the uh, UV light uh, shine. And so that makes the difference in the color of these scorpions. Now, let's move on to snakes. We were driving along at night uh, and we just happened to see at the side of a road a red spitting cobra. Well, that was our opportunity. A red spitting cobra is one of the things that I had on my list to see. Don't do that yet. Wait, wait. The cobra is about to escape into the grass where he's going to be perfectly safe. And then for reasons I don't understand, he completely turns around and crosses back across the road again, going into the grass on the other side. And this gives us plenty of time to get out and get snake sticks.
Now that classic uh, cobra hood is up and it's obvious what kind of snake this is. Also from time to time he's going to be spitting. Right there, he spit right there where I've frozen the frame. Now if the cobra spit uh, gets into your eyes or a wound or your mouth or something then you've got a problem. Otherwise it's not a big problem. So if you're wearing glasses or goggles or something you're going to be reasonably safe but if it gets into your eyes you could go blind. Permanently blind. And of course uh, if the snake should bite you it can inject a great deal of venom. Spitters create a great deal of venom. Okay. Mm -hmm. In a sense, this is rather iconic. Because of the lighting, uh, there are shadows of four cobras uh, behind this one cobra. It reminds you of uh, some of the uh, pictures that you've seen of uh, imaginary cobras or mythical cobras. Well, that cobra was found by sheer luck. Let's see what kind of luck we have when we're actually looking for them. Now this is the kind of cobra that made Royan famous. Uh, he was the one that identified it as a specific separate species and it's the world's largest spitting cobra. The large brown spitting cobra can be as much as about 10 feet long. Okay. 
Chica. Don Chica. Notice that the bag is being double knotted. For the most part, that's really just a signal to people that there's a very dangerous snake inside this bag. So here we've got a green mamba. I'm going to try and milk one of these to show you today. So if I show you the fangs here, the fangs on a on a mamba are quite forward in the in the mouth. Um, so I'll just lift the, the jaw up a little bit and you can see those fangs. So they're very small compared to the vipers um, and they don't produce as much venom but it, it whacks a real punch. And there we're through. So now we just let it give it a, a, a bite. As you can see you don't get very much, it's only a couple of drops and just give the snake a little bit of a, let it just do its own biting. There was a time we used to massage the venom glands, but we tend to find that that actually stresses the snake a little bit too much. So you'll see you get a tiny, tiny amount of, of, of venom. Um, there's a little bit of clear liquid in that, in that glass you can just see. Um, and so when we do it commercially, we will collect several several species sev several different snakes of the same species will muck them into the glass usually you can't get more than about 20 to 30 um, before the top of the glass has got so many holes that the, the membrane is not working properly in which case you flick to a second glass and then from there we will then take that and we desiccate it or we freeze dry it depending on 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 which way we are preparing it and then from then it goes on and it's used for two things. It's used in the manufacture of, of anti-venom and it is also used in, in medical research. So here at Biochem we milk both green mambas, which are, as you can see, it's quite a big snake but not huge. And then black mambas, which are, are not black, they're grey, about two or three times the length. And the inside of the mouth is, is, is black, which is what gives it its name. And so this is an eastern green mamba and on that note I'll go and put it back in its in its cage So here you can see one of our, our really big puff adders. I'm just going to milk it here to show you the long fangs and the venom. Whoa. So if you come in a little bit, I can show you the, the fangs through the clear glass. You can see how really, really long they are. And so the head is actually just between my fingers here. So it looks like it goes all the way back, but the jaws on a, on a viper go all the way back behind the head. 
and that's what allows them to, to swallow a very large meal. So the puff adders we get in Kenya are actually very large, as you can see here, and they will eat animals like hares and hyrax, and so to be able to swallow something that big, you do need to have the wider mouth gape. So you can see the venom on the fangs there, sort of just dripping off. Um, so let me put him back. So picking them up is relatively easy. It's it's really putting the snake back that you've got to be careful because it's a very large, fat, slow snake, but the strike is very quick and it's actually probably one of the most dangerous parts of handling a puff adder when you are securely holding it behind the head is actually putting it back in the box. So here I can show you some of the venom and different species of snakes have different colored venoms. This one I usually describe it to people as light colored egg yolk um, and once this is dry in puff adder venom it looks a little bit like soap flakes um, when you have snakes like mambas, uh, it tends to look like dried sugar, like sugar crystals or, or jelly crystals, slightly different color, like a bit more yellow in the, in the forest cobras and in the, in the spitting cobras. So that in the tissue under the skin will cause you a lot of problems. Um, and so anti-venom is what you will need to treat a, a, a venomous snake bite like that. So there you go, that's the venom of a puff adder.
snake. Teddy Roosevelt said that the Maneaters at Savo was the most remarkable account of any that we have on record. But that doesn't really answer the basic question, which is, why were the Maneaters of Savo eating people? Now, as much as the Brits were completely full of themselves with the idea of saving Africa from the Africans, there was truth to what they were saying about their attempts to end slavery. Savo was routinely crossed by Arab slaver caravans on their way to the slave markets in Mombasa. In fact, it may be because of these caravans why these man-eating lions ever became such a problem. The appalling conditions of the long, arduous journey to Mombasa would have resulted in a number of sick slaves. The Arab slavers would then just toss the dead and dying into the African bush, making easy prey for the lions. These caravans went on uninterrupted for centuries, and it's quite possible that the Savo lions had gotten used to the taste of human flesh. So when the British finally put an end to the African slave trade, the Arab slavers may have left, but the lions certainly didn't. And the very bridge Patterson was tasked to build was right on the foundations of the Savo lions' hunting grounds. Another reason why so many of the construction crew were killed by these lions was due to their country of origin. Since many of the African natives refused to work on building this bridge, the British resorted to importing thousands of Indians instead. Unlike the African locals who were used to the wildlife in Savo, these poor men knew little to nothing about how to protect themselves. They were probably more focused on just doing their jobs and not in their worst nightmares would they have considered that they were being watched. There was also the issue of just how many of them there were. Up to several thousand men were scattered all along the railroad for up to 30 miles. These small pockets of campsites were extremely isolated, exposed and vulnerable out in the open. So when the lion attacks began, they had absolutely no protection. Now, although the lives of the construction crew was indeed Patterson's responsibility, the fact of the matter was that he was just simply not an experienced hunter. What would often happen is that he would spend the night in a tree close to where a lion attack had originally taken place. He would then wake up and find out the next morning that the lions had attacked in a completely different part of the camp. Two are dead now in two nights. The second. Far end of the camp. A man wandering alone at night. There's even less of him than there was of Mahina. What made matters even worse was just the lack of firearms that were available. Out of thousands of workers sprawled out for miles building this bloody bridge and railway, there were very few guns between them, and the guys who had guns would be running around like crazy trying to get to wherever the next line attack was, and by the time they got there, it was usually too late. 
So the next solution in trying to defend themselves was to build these really sharp thorn bush fences around their camps called bomas. Now, bomas generally do tend to work in keeping lions out in other parts of Africa, but these lions would almost magically appear and disappear as if the bomas weren't even there at all. This is the moment when some of the locals stopped even seeing them as lions, but as supernatural predators. As good a movie as The Ghost in the Darkness is, in terms of its historical account, it does have one major flaw. I think that the biggest historical inaccuracy are with the lions themselves. Now, you think that wouldn't be the case, since the movie consistently points out that there is something very special about these lions, something that sets them apart from all others. There's a legend here. Two man-eaters are making all the trouble. Well, this is Africa, Patterson. I thought you were a hunter. It's not that simple. These lions are... not like lions. But apparently, this is only just referring to their savagery and being extremely intelligent. And whilst, yes, this is all absolutely true, the filmmakers also decided to exclude one very important detail. Lions from Savo are actually maneless. Now, you might be wondering why on earth am I being so picky over such a seemingly small detail? Well, the truth of the matter is that it might actually have a lot to do with exactly why these lions were so effective in killing people. Although scientists still don't know exactly why Savo male lions are maneless, there are a couple of theories that do help explain. One being that manes tend to be impractical in this part of Africa and get in the way of their hunting due to the local vegetation, and that by being thorny bushes. It starts to make sense exactly how those lions were able to get past those impregnable bomas, since more than likely, they were able just to squeeze right through them. Another theory being that Savo male lions have higher levels of testosterone that reduces their chances in having mates. That in turn would also explain why they are so formidably dangerous and aggressive. Savo male lions are also known to be much larger than other males. When Patterson finally shot the real lions, they were measured to be nine feet in length. Now, when we think of male lions, we usually think of lions that look more like this. Full manes. And if you want to see male lions that have full manes, you want to go to some place where it's cold, like uh, the Atlas Mountains of Morocco or the highlands of Ethiopia or even Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, where it's warmer, they tend to have less manes. Also, in zoos, you can take a, a your zoo lion and you can actually get rid of the mane uh, by giving it a sufficient amount of testosterone. It's kind of like male pattern baldness. And one other thing that was just mentioned is that these lions at Savo also tend to be quite large. Well, in the Pleistocene, uh, in the Ice Age, we have many drawings on caves of lions, and none of them have manes. And so the theory is that the Pleistocene male lions did not have manes, and they were probably much larger than today's lion. Perhaps they had more testosterone, now there is an old theory that calls such lions buffalo lions, lions that are large, uh, maneless, uh, high testosterone, that uh, tend to uh, hunt uh, buffalo. Now that I have established exactly why having these lions be maneless is such an important detail, the next obvious question is, why do the filmmakers feel the need to ditch it? Well, to be honest, I don't know exactly why they did. I mean, like, maybe because Manes just look so awesome on the lion, and having them doesn't really take too much away from the movie. Or quite possibly, it was much more practical to find and train a common main lion. I mean, to be honest, I think this is nerve-wracking enough, rather than finding the courage to work with the infamous Savo lions. In the movie The Ghost in the Darkness, the movie company actually used a number of different lions, but two of the main lions were Caesar and Bongo. And Caesar and Bongo both came from Canada, and they were movie lions. They appeared in lots of Hollywood movies. For example, those are the lions that you see in George of the Jungle. Ah! 
One of the most persistent reasons for why man-eaters become man-eaters is usually because they have trouble catching their prey. In 1898, there was a rinderpest outbreak, and that not only decreased the amount of cattle in this area, it decreased the amount of wildlife as well. And that could be one of the reasons why they turned to man-eating. Another possible reason is that they might have had dental problems. In fact, that's fairly common. The, la uh, the lion that is the uh, man-eater of Mfue had dental problems, and so did both of the lions in The Ghost in the Darkness. In fact, one of them had quite severe dental problems. Now take a look at the lion's skull in front, and you'll see in the lower jaw there's a great deal of damage. Now, Patterson said that he had done that with his 303 rifle. However, modern analysis by dental experts say that that abscess had been there for a very long time, and Patterson couldn't possibly have caused that damage. This damage is sufficient that it could have impeded the lion's hunting capability. So anyway, this means that my next objective uh, in Savo uh, is to find a large uh, maneless male lion. Uh, this proves to be more difficult than you'd think. The first cat I saw wasn't uh, a lion or, or even a leopard. Uh, instead, it was a serval cat. I've never seen one before. And this one was right up on the road and not the least bit uh, cautious or afraid. And that's interesting because these cats are usually very, very secretive. So I asked the driver to uh, back up so that I could get a better view. And sure enough, on the other side of that bush, the cat had stopped, uh, stopped to clean himself up. And uh, he's only a few feet away. And uh, it's a, a remarkable bit of footage, for as far as I'm concerned, of a serval cat. Look at those ears. Uh, those ears are each radar dishes, and they're controlled by 21 muscles apiece. And that neck is especially long. In fact, the body's quite long. This cat is nothing short of a super mouser. The next cat I saw was a lion, in fact several of them, but not exactly the ones that I was looking for. We rounded a corner and stopped the safari vehicle because we found mom and two little fur balls. Now the one that just got up, uh, that's the male. He's slightly bigger and he's uh, fueled with high testosterone. He is. Uh, ready to take on the world at least as long as mom is there. The kid decides that he's going to stalk the safari vehicle and uh, little sister is not very far behind. Incidentally these guys are only about uh, six weeks old or so. Well, it looks like Mom's had enough. Uh, after all, uh, those uh, monkeys over there are dangerous, and uh, the kid uh, really can't handle them.
or beasts with quite so little hair. I'm gonna be the main event, like the king was before. I'm brushing up, I'm looking down, I'm working on my board. Oh, thus far, a rather an inspiring thing. Saying do this. Now when I said that, no one's saying be there. What a no one's saying stop that. No, you don't no one's saying be here. Now say it here. Rita run around all day. Well, that's definitely out. Rita do it all my way. I think it's time that you and I arranged a heart to heart. Kings don't need advice. Count me out, out of service, out of Africa. I wouldn't hang about. This child is getting wildly out of wing. Oh, I just can't wait to be Now, Mom's standing up and facing the direction she is because she's heard a familiar voice. Uh, that's the uh, cub's father out in the distance. You may not be able to hear it. It's pretty soft. Uh, but every once in a while, he gives a little growl. And she faces in his direction. I figure that the internet is full of kittens because kittens are so darn cute. And uh, these lion cubs are playing just like they were kittens. And so they're also just so darn cute. Okay, did somebody get hurt there? Well, Mom's going to check it out.
Okay, now it's time to attack Mom's tail. But Mom's headed off towards the sound of the cub's father, and the cubs are going to have to follow her. This is Papa. His mane is short, but he's not exactly maneless either. But these weren't the maneless male lions that I was looking for. And it got down to the last day at Savo and we still hadn't found one. So we sent out the word to every uh, ranger and guide in, uh, in the park and offered a reward of a thousand Kenyan shillings uh, for uh, a, a reported sighting that we'd be interested in. And finally, we did get a message <clears throat> that someone at a lodge called Satao might have seen what we were looking for. So we went over there. Remember these two bridges going to Satao because we're coming back to them. Now, when we do reach Satao, uh, we discovered that in fact uh, lions, male lions, have been seen. There's a trio of uh, brothers not too far away. And so we take off from Satao and we go looking for them, but we don't get very far. No, indeed, pretty quickly we discover we have a flat tire on the right rear. And uh, uh, we replace that tire, uh, but we've only got one spare and that means that right now uh, we don't have a, a good spare tire. Uh, then uh, after we've replaced this tire uh, we walk around to the other side and the uh, left rear tire is also flat. Now what we suspect happened was that when we drove over those bridges and then drove back over there must have been something protruding up on them that punctured first one tire and then the other. Now the uh, left uh, rear tire has got a pretty slow leak on it so what we're going to do is we're going to pump it up and go back to Sitao. Uh, we're getting those tires repaired uh, a patch on one and a patch and a tube on the other and the reason why we don't put tubes in both of them is because there was only one tube. When we get the tires repaired, we put the uh, best repaired tire on the left rear. Uh, this is the uh, tire that has the tube in it. And the one that's just been patched that we couldn't put a tube on, well, that becomes the spare. And we head out and pretty quickly uh, we discover uh, some evidence of a, a kill. Apparently a lion has uh, killed something and the uh, vultures are, are cleaning up right now. So uh, we're uh, looking around for lions and uh, watching the vultures at pretty much the same time. Of course, eventually the uh, vultures do get their fill and uh, the result of that is uh, that a jackal comes in and uh, he fills his uh, tummy. The lions have clearly left this particular kill site, but since we're near a water hole, it's unlikely that they went far. They're someplace in the shade, uh, and they'll come back for water at a later time and perhaps another kill at a later time, but right now it's shade they're looking for, and in fact that's come where we find them. There's three brothers here. Uh, now one has 
uh, what passes for a full name mm. for Sambo. One has a very skimpy name, mm. and one has no name at all. Now they're quite a distance away. They're you conveniently see, uh, and so we're not going to get a really good view of them. Now these three males uh, are known as the Satao Four. Um, the reason that they're the four instead of three is that one of the lions is missing. Actually, it's a, a lioness. She's out uh, giving birth to cubs someplace. Uh, but she's the only female in this uh, three male uh, pride. Now these specific lions are referred to as buffalo lions. Um, they are in fact specialists in large prey like Cape buffalo or elephant or hippopotamus or something like that. In this particular case uh, they tend to go after Cape buffalo and uh, baby elephants. So that's the sort of lions that they are. They are probably full of testosterone, uh, which is why the manes are so skimpy, and they're quite large, and they're quite able to take on large prey. Can only see the one that uh, seems to have a mane now. Yeah, and then just if you look at his bottom. Yeah, the the brother, the, ones the face out. is there. Yeah. Okay, and the, and the third brother's just gone and sat these little oh, I, down. In yeah, the I see him. I see his shadow. His silhouette. So when we first saw him, we we didn't realize whether they killed something because it was dark or whether he was just lying in the shade. Well, we're not quite at the end of the story, even though we have found the large maneless lion. And the reason is because uh, on our way back, we uh, took a, a side uh, road, uh, one that's not uh, frequently traveled, and uh, headed back towards our lodge. And as we did, we got our third flat tire of the day. The tire that had a tube and had been patched went down and shredded. Absolutely, it's the one in the center. Uh, we didn't have uh, but that one patched uh, spare uh, on the back, but that was enough to get us back to the lodge. Now, because Patterson's story is so incredible, there are many skeptics out there in the academic community who just find it all hard to believe. And you know what? I can't exactly blame them. I mean, there are so many things that Patterson reported seeing in his book, The Man Eaters of Savo, that read like fantastic fiction. One event that stands out from any other actually took place after Patterson had killed the lions. Whilst Patterson was hunting in the African bush, he came across a cave and was compelled to go in. Upon entering the cave, he made a horrifying discovery. Holy Christ. Lions don't do this. Never had a layer like this. They're doing it for the pleasure. It sounds like it's totally made up, and for the longest time, that's exactly what people thought Patterson did. That he embellished in the story a little bit to spice things up. The only proof he had was a picture taken of the cave entrance. The whereabouts of this cave became a total mystery until it was rediscovered in 1997. However, scientists were unable to find the piles of human bones Patterson described, allowing some historians to even question how much of his story with the lions was even true. That the 135 victims Patterson claimed had been killed by the lions might also have been exaggerated. After all, the Ugandan Railway Company only acknowledged the deaths of 28 Indian workers, but I think it's quite possible that the British weren't particularly great at record keeping, or for that matter, cared how many Africans and Indians died building their railway. I'm also sure they would have considered the whole man-eating affair thing to be quite embarrassing. 
Do we wish the world to think that the builders of the British Empire are afraid to do their job because of a few minor difficulties with the local wildlife? Nevertheless, scientists recently took hair samples from the stuffed man-eaters that are now on display at the Chicago Field Museum, and then they analyzed their chemical composition to determine how many people they actually ate in the last three months of their lives. The research concluded that one lion ate 11 people and the other ate 24, thereby confirming some historians' suspicions. However, this only proves how many people they ate and doesn't disprove Patterson's claims that these lions were mostly just killing for fun. Which I think is more than a possibility. I mean, like, if you look at your common house cats, you can see how much pleasure it gets in killing mice that they never eat. All of these points are indeed quite plausible, but that's not what people have a hard time in believing. It's simply the alarming numbers that these lions killed, because nothing like this has ever happened before or since. We as human beings take great pride in our conquest over the natural world, but we also find the idea truly disturbing when nature fights back. Now, I find it a little bit disturbing uh, that the cave, uh, Patterson's Cave, was rediscovered the year after the movie The Ghost in the Darkness came out, and it had been lost for so long. Uh, nevertheless, the pictures of the cave do look a little bit like Patterson's pictures. Uh, the bones, on the other hand, uh, I'm told that the bones were taken to uh, Nairobi, which is where they are now. Um, that it's also possible that the local people recollected them because you see this probably wasn't the man-eaters cave instead uh, the local Tata people uh, have a, um, uh, a a custom of reburying their dead uh, and the skeletons are put uh, in some sacred place and it's entirely possible indeed uh, likely that what Patterson discovered uh, was not the lion's den but rather a secondary uh, burial site used by local folks. If you want to see the lions today, you must go to America. They are at the Field Museum in Chicago, Illinois. Even now, if you dare lock eyes with them, you will be afraid. end of the ghost in the darkness doesn't really mark the end of the Patterson story. In fact, he stays with the British Army for a very long time. Remember, this is 1898, and he stayed all the way through World War I. In fact, in World War I, he was the commander of a, a Jewish brigade in the British Army, uh, the first one that they'd ever founded. And the fact that he was that uh, commander may very well had, have had an impact on his career because he was never promoted above lieutenant colonel. However, Netanyahu a few years ago did proclaim Patterson as the founder of the Israeli Defense Forces. <laughs> 